Hi, hello. Hello, Dr. Ali. Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Hi. Ali. Hi. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Ali. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, and um, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Candice from Estonic Medical. Estonic is the innovator of the ultrasound, dedicated ultrasound for dedicated application. Thank you to join our Estonic 99 Count Global Webinar. Our webinar includes five sections, about one and a half hours. Please use Q&A function of Zoom platform for ask questions. Our professor will answer questions at the end of the webinar. Today, our topic is focused on airway ultrasound implant like malarial trauma. It's really a great honor to invite Dr. Ali to be as our speaker, in particular, thanks to Dr. Veda as our moderator. Now, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Yap from Spectral Scientific. He's the distributor of, of Visonic in Malaysia. Okay, please, Yap. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Candice from MySonic. Good afternoon to all the doctors from around the world. My name is Yap. I'm the general manager of Spectra Scientific. We are the proud distributor of MySonic ultrasound system in Malaysia. As we all know, MySonic has been a very intuitive, innovative, and great ultrasound system. If you are in Malaysia and you need any information, please do not hesitate to give me a call or contact us. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today. It is a great pleasure for us to have Dr. Rita Zahara Ibrahim, a famous renowned uh, ca cardiovascular consultant in Indonesia. Please allow me to briefly introduce her. She's a cardiovascular intensive care consultant in post-cardiac surgery intensive care unit and also a cardiologist consultant in National Cardiovascular Center, Harapan Kita Hospital in Jakarta, Indonesia. She's a lecturer in the Department of Cardiology and Vascular Medicine in University Indonesia, and she's also the coordinator and instructor for the World Interactive Network Focus of Critical Ultrasound, which is Twin Focus for Indonesia. Coordinator and instructor of Rapid Assessment by Echocardiography, RACE, Nippon Institute of Critical Care Education and Research for Indonesia. Without further ado, let's welcome our moderator of today, Dr. Rita Zahara. Um. Okay, please, Yev, yeah, introduce our Dr. Ali again. Yev, yeah, please. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Dr. Ali? Mm, yes. Oh, just a moment. Okay. Sorry, just give me a second. Mm. Okay, our speaker for today is actually Dr. Adi. As we all know, he's a famous uh, emergency, department special, uh, emergency department specialist from Ipo Hospital. Let me just... Sorry, some technical issues. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So Dr. Dr. Adi Osman, he is a senior consultant emergency physician and END critical care, resuscitation and emergency critical care unit, trauma and emergency department, Hospital Raja from Masuri Finan Ipo, Perak, Malaysia. Um, he will be our speaker for today to talk about focused airway ultrasound in blunt neck, larigal and trauma. Without further ado, let us also welcome our speaker of today, Dr. Adi Osman. Okay, welcome our Dr. Ali. Hi, Dr. Ali. <gasps> Hi, could you open your, yes. Hi, Dr. Ali, can you say uh, our audience? <laughs> say hello, our audience. All right, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the uh, Wisonic for uh, giving me opportunity to actually uh, share some of our experience using uh, 
heavy ultrasound, especially in uh, assessing a possible uh, laryngeal uh, injury. Uh, and of course, uh, the usage of this will be uh, benefit. Uh, I personally think in uh, early management of patient that uh, we suspect uh, having laryngeal uh, trauma. Right. Uh, so uh, I actually uh, still communicating with Dr. Rita Zahara. She's having problem with the there's some technical glitch. Uh, she's supposed to be the moderator. So I think uh, what I can suggest now, uh, I already prepared the uh, video. Uh, I think uh, can this do you yes, can yes, you play the yes. video? Please? Okay, I will share the video. Thank you, Dr. Rita, for a kind introduction. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Visonic for giving me an uh, opportunity to discuss about this topic. A uh, focused airway ultrasound in blunt neck and laryngeal trauma. My name is Adi Osman. I'm from Malaysia. And I work in this uh, hospital. This is uh, our uh, district called Ipo. And our hospital is somewhere near here. We published this article way back in 2020, whereby we discussed a novel role of a focused airway ultrasound in early assessment, airway assessment of suspected laryngeal trauma. And but before I uh, do a deep dive into this topic, I would like to thank these uh, people, Ms. Anisha Bala, ENT surgeon from Malacca, Dr. Chong Chi Kiong, Dr. Tan Wan Chuan, Dr. Lai Siki, and Win Focus, IMS, ICCS, and Success for the assistant. This is my uh, potential conflict of interest uh, in regards to a topic that I'm going to discuss today. My first question before we go on with this uh, presentation is... Uh, do we really need a AVA ultrasound for all AVA assessment in our daily practice as emergency physician, as critical care or intensivist? My, my honest answer will be no. We don't need this. Uh, we just with our finger, uh, just is, uh, we can pump it superficially because the structure is very superficial. We can pump it where it's cricothyroid membrane and we can do cricothyroidotomy. We can even pump it for the trachea uh, where we want to do a tracheostomy or percutaneous tracheostomy. So we don't really need uh, AV ultrasound. In all cases, all AV assessment that we use in our daily practice. But in certain conditions, for example, in these two cases, when you have a patient that difficult to intubate and also difficult to ventilate, patient with a abnormal neck pathology, patient obese, patient with a neck trauma, whereby you can't palpate any of this, you can't either you can intubate or you can ventilate. Or in example, in this type of patient, definitely in both of these three these cases, in these three cases, you might need to use airway ultrasound. In the third cases that I share here, almost impossible to palpate where is the cricothyroid membrane or even to palpate for the tracheal cartilage. So airway ultrasound might be helpful and it might be an end. Uh, saving, uh, uh, life saving, uh, life saving, uh, procedure in this type of patient. So my question, second question, which is more accurate in terms of sensitivity and specificity? Palpation, finger palpation, or maybe ultrasound? This is an interesting, uh, study published by CDK et al published at the in December 2018, whereby they are trying to figure out which one is more superior, palpation or ultrasound in identifying the cricothyroid membrane in subject with poorly defined neck landmark. This is a prospective 
randomized study on almost 223 adult patients with abnormal neck pathology. So adult with a neck pathology that going for a neck surgery, irradiation, or those with neck mass, which, which, in which the schedule for a neck CT scan was randomized into two groups. One is external finger palpation. The other, the other group is using airway ultrasound to identify where is the cricotarot membrane. So what they did in this study, they investigated to place a radio opaque dot over the cricotarot membrane, which is based on finding during palpation and ultrasound examination. And of course, the result is blended to the study. Uh, with and compared with the radiology blended to the study, which is which in which they will assess the correct placement of cricotarot membrane. What they found is quite interesting. If you use palpation, the sensitivity, the distance, uh, the accuracy is only eight percent, and if you use ultrasound, it's almost eighty-one percent. So the difference is almost 70% in which the p-value is quite significant. So there is a, such a significant difference in terms of uh, uh, palpation, external palpation versus uh, AV ultrasound in those patients with polar defined neck landmark or those with the neck pathology. We know that uh, intubation and tracheostomy are the two most common procedures performed in our emergency critical care. And why? Uh, this is important because urgent emergent this uh, AVA management uh, uh, might, yeah, might entail an, an increased risk of major complication, for example, hypoxia, hypotension, or even cardiac arrest. This is an uh, uh, article, interesting article that was published a uh, few months ago in Critical Care Medicine, whereby they discussed what's new in AV management of critically ill patients. But sad to say, uh, regardless, okay, regardless, uh, and uh, we know now there's a lot of evidence uh, of AV ultrasound, especially in AV management. In this article, AV ultrasound was not discussed, or not even been picked up by this article. Arguably, the first article that discussed on uh, the first few articles in the emergency critical care world that discussed on AV ultrasound was published by same journal by Professor Alan Sustik way back in way back in 2007. And this is kind of images, image and video and images that we can get from those days, uh, the ultrasound those days. With advancement of technology, especially when we talk about a portable ultrasound, laptop ultrasound, this is kind of images that we can get from our current available uh, uh, portable ultrasound. Things that we can't see those days, for example, uh, we can't see much on this uh, soft tissue below the uh, cartilage, the endolaring area, we can't see much of this uh, soft tissue above it. We, we didn't. We can't see much on this tissue, for example, the false lumen, anything beyond it. And when and with the new technology now, we can even differentiate where's the cartilage, and we can see whether the cartilage is this bit involved. We can even see this. We can now visualize the submucosal area which lining the tracheal uh, cartilage. Uh, of late, there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of review, there's a lot of study that looking on AV ultrasound. It's just to share a few of our uh, review regarding the AV ultrasound and of course the usage of AV ultrasound with the, our knowledge of this sono anatomy of the upper AV. For example, in AV size prediction, in difficult laryngoscopy, uh, AV uh, device placement and there we can use it for percutaneous cricotarotomy. We can use it in percutaneous dilatational uh, tracheostomy. We can even predict 
the post establishment stride or, or predicting the size of double lumen tube, for example, and we can evaluate now uh, the epiglottis with ultrasound. So before we uh, do a deep dive into this topic, the first thing that uh, the most fundamental thing that we should be able to do is to know how to perform a correct or probably uh, to do the AV ultrasound systematically in a well-organized form. So uh, the first step one is to do a transverse view at the level of a suprasternal notch. So how to do it? We place the probe in the transverse orientation at the level of suprasternal notch. And this is the image that you will see if you put your probe somewhere here on top of the tracheal cartilage. The first structure you should be able to see is a thoracic tissue there. And you might see this hypoacute structure uh, which is seen as a, an inverted U-shape and is hypoacute. So this is a cartilage. This is cartilage. And below the cartilage, you will see the hyperacute line which follow the shape of the tracheal cartilage. And this is the air mucosal interface, meaning we know that based on anatomy, inside the trachea is an air. So this area is the one that could, huh, that, 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 that probably the, the, the area of interest in this lecture, which is the submucosal area or uh, endo uh, layering area. Okay. So this is just uh, uh, the uh, representative of this uh, picture. So that is a uh, mucosal interface, and the other thing is that. Uh, because this is just a reverberation, uh, this is just a reverberation, you might see a lot of what we call it, cometal uh, artifact beyond this hyper quick line. So this is just a reverberation effect, it doesn't uh, uh, have any functional in terms of uh, usage for us. So the hyper quick line, we need to check out this is a air mucosal interface. So there's a, there's a few structure, the few uh, uh, ultrasound uh, image, okay, uh, finding that uh, very important if you want to do uh, AV ultrasound. Number one is the cartilage. Number two, the air mucosal interface. Right. Step two, we need to move the transducer in the careful direction from the step one. Meaning, just now we put the probe somewhere here. Now we move toward the head of cafflet. And you should be able to see this structure. Similar uh, is seen as an inverted U-shape. But the difference is you can see, compare from this structure, step one and step two, there is increase in terms of thickness of this cartilage, this structure. So this is uh, somewhere here, which is a cricot cartilage. Right? And in this picture, you can see this is a cricot cartilage. And below the cricot cartilage, you will see the air mucosal interface, the hyperacute line, which is an air mucosal interface. And this is the stenocleidomastoid muscle, right? In the step three, we need to move the transducer in the capillary direction from the step two. And there's a few tricks that we need to do. We need to tilt our transducer a bit, okay? then we should be able to see this structure. And from this structure, you will see this is the tarot cartilage. This is tarot cartilage. And you should be able to see VL is a vocal ligament. Okay? That's, that is the uh, arytenoid uh, cartilage there. And this is the cartilage. And you can see the difference between this step two the, and step one, this is tracheal cartilage, which is hypoacute. And you can see the tracheal cartilage is slightly less hypoacute. And you see the tracheal cartilage is no more hypoacute because the, 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 the content, water content in this cartilage is less now, right? So this is a 
thyroid cartilage. Right? And you can ask patient to AB duck, yes, and AD duck and AB duck, huh? By, by, by asking patient to talk or to prone, uh, do a, uh, move the vocal cord and you should be able to see something like this. So this is the vocal cord at the AB duck and AD duck, uh, AB duction, huh? During the pronation, right? And the other thing that uh, you should be able to visualize, the vocal cord is AB duct towards the midline, okay? AB duct to its midline uh, during this pronation. And of course, the hyperacric, if we look carefully into this picture, the hyperacric appearance of uh, vocal ligament uh, that delineates the vocal cord. Uh, this is the vocal ligament, right? So I repeat, the one of the most important uh, maneuver that you need to do is to move the transducer forward towards capillary and you need to tilt. You need to tilt your probe like this. Then you should be able to see this thyroid cartilage, right? And you see the 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 echogenicity of thyroid is no more hypoacric as compared to thyroid or cricot cartilage. Then we do a step five. Uh, we have to move the transducer toward the cathlet, towards the head slightly, and you should be able to see the structure. Bear in mind, we are not looking anymore at the cartilage now. We are looking at the bone. Now this is a higher bone. So you know the bone in terms of density, it contains less water. Hmm? So reflect almost all the ultrasound wave. So what we happen is you're going to see a acoustic shadow there. Huh? And this is the anterior part, the anterior contact of the higher bone, right? But uh, personally, I think to do a transverse view of higher bone is a bit difficult. A bit difficult. The easiest way is to do a step six, whereby you need to rotate your uh, ultrasound transducer and try to look at higher bone at a longitudinal view. The One of the trick to do to get this higher bone is first to identify the thyroid cartilage. And once you identify the thyroid cartilage, you, you will see this thyrohyoid membrane. And if you follow towards the head, towards the cathlet, you're going to see a something like this. Yeah? This is a higher bone. And most of the time, you will see the acoustic shadow there, right? and you only can see, you will only be able to see the anterior cortex of the higher bone, right? Step seven. We place the transducer at longitudinal orientation just above the supra sternal node. It's just something similar. Uh, in the step one, we do a transverse view, transverse scan. Now we do a longitudinal scan and what we are, should be able to see is a cricot cartilage, which is seen as the hypoacric structure with a harm, or some people call it a bump, that is cephalic to the tracker cartilage. And of course, if you look carefully into this, the tracker cartilage in a longitudinal plane appear as a string of, bit, scrap most of the uh, atras, airway ultrasound author as a string of bits which also hypoacric relatively to the thyroid tissue, right? So the question, the second question that uh, people always ask me, uh, which one is T1, which one is uh, tracheal cartilage number two? The easiest way to differentiate between T1 and T2 is T1 is always, always the longest in terms of length as compared to T2. This is very important later on when we want to do uh, ultrasound guided percutaneous uh, trachostomy, for example, whereby we want to identify where is the T1, T2, T3, T3 and so forth, so on. Right? So I repeat, the longest uh, in terms of length is always T1. So there's cricot. So you know this T1, T2 and so on. And this is a uh, drawing representative of this uh, image. 
the next step is to move the probe towards the cephalon at the long, you looking at the longitudinal view of this uh, tricotarot membrane. Right. So this is thyroid, this is cartilage, and you see there is a membrane there. Uh, we used to believe that a thyroid, tricotarot membrane is not that thick, but in reality, based on this, uh, our ultrasound finding, yeah, it's quite thick. Uh, it's quite thick. So this is a cricothyroid membrane. Right? This is just an MRI a representative of this area, a cricothyroid membrane. Right? And below this is the similar, the air mucosal interface. The other thing that uh, I want to highlight in this lecture is looking at this air mucosal interface is quite important later on uh, where we want to determine the possibility of uh, laryngeal trauma. Right. The last step, after uh, step nine, uh, every ultrasound is not complete if you don't do the esophagus. And this is part of the, 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 the protocol that we used to do when we do every ultrasound, especially when we want to use every ultrasound to determine uh, the ET tube placement. Uh, to get the esophagus, you need to add, uh, put your probe somewhere between the uh, cricot or cackle cartilage. But the most important structure, you need to go laterally and identify the thyroid cartilage, thyroid, thyroid tissue, right? Thyroid tissue. And posterior to thyroid tissue is your esophagus, is fashion esophagus. You can even do the longitudinal uh, axis of the esophagus. Right? Right. The last question. Is there any role of AV ultrasound in blood, neck, or laryngeal trauma? Few years back, we have one patient that presented to us with a neck injury, uh, and we suspect this patient is having some form of uh, laryngeal trauma uh, uh, due to this uh, blood, neck trauma, blood injury. And when we did the AV ultrasound, we found this. Uh, we're not sure what is happening now, but we notice that this is not normal. So we published this article uh, as an abstract in Critical Care in uh, 2019. Uh, what we found in this, just to, 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 to compare, this is normal cricothyroid membrane. This is the air mucosal interface. And this is what we saw a few years ago. And what we notice, number one, there is a break in the continuity of this mucosal interface, number one. Number two, we found there is slightly increase in terms of uh, thickness of the soft tissue that below this cartilage, which is, uh, in our opinion at the point of time, is the tissue that line, the uh, mucosal tissue that line the, the, the the tracheal cartilage. This is tracheal, this cricot, that's true. There is a mucosal, uh, based on anatomy, there is a mucosal uh, tissue that line this uh, cartilage. There is increase, right? So we're not sure about what's happening. And of course, uh, at that time, we are trying to figure out what actually we've seen, what is we seen by us. And of course, at that point of time, uh, we don't have much uh, evidence. Uh, we don't have much uh, what called literature, which is uh, looking at this uh, airway ultrasound to look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, laryngeal trauma or blood neck trauma. Right. We know that uh, laryngeal injury is uh, often in uh, undiagnosed in initial evaluation of the trauma. Uh, it's rare, but it's a life threatening, and it. It, uh, estimated incident is one in 30,000 emergency department uh, admission, right? And of course, the things that worry us is delay recon term of recognition and intervention may prove to be fatal in the presence of upper airway obstruction. So the thing is, what we worry is the upper airway obstruction due to, I call it misdiagnosis or delay in term of recognition of this laryngeal injury. And without me knowing, uh, probably uh, even though it's rare, one of the cause of uh, laryngeal trauma is percutaneous tracheostomy. Right? Number two is our daily 
endotracheal division. In fact, there is a series, a case series was published in Grillo et al. in Journal of Thoracic Surgery way back in 1979, where, where they found that out of 208 patients that received oppression and uh, to repair the injuries resulting, especially resulting from tracheal intubation and from tracheal stomy injuries. Right. So 185 from tracheostomy injuries and 28 is actually from endotracheal intubation. This is something probably uh, just a tip of iceberg because uh, most of us, we don't aware about this injury. Right? And uh, even even after patient was intubated or patient was, uh, the tracheostomy was done. Okay. There is an interesting study uh, was published uh, based on 27 ex uh, years experience by Professor Stephen Schiffer. Uh, this is uh, the acute care of this 139 consecutive patient with external laryngeal trauma over 27 years period. What they they, they actually come back come on with the 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 the, the, the protocol how to manage uh, patient with uh, laryngeal trauma. And they look at the relative consistency in terms of management principle throughout this series, right? And of course, uh, this is quite a high uh, equity in terms of a number of trauma patients in the US at that point of time. What is the interesting thing that I want to share in this article is this is when they come up with this uh, classification. Uh, honestly, I don't know about this classification until I come across this uh, patient with laryngeal trauma. And this classification was shared by one of my this friend from the department. Okay? And it's called, it's called a Schiffer classification of laryngeal injury. And this, in, and based on this, uh, uh, classification and based on CT scan finding, they come out with Group one until uh, group two and so on until group five. One differentiate between these two is group one, group two is considered as a minor, group three and above is considered as a major injury. It differ in term of management. Group one, group two, most 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 of the cases will be treated as conservative. Of course, in the true group three and above, this is a. Uh, it, uh, the, the most patient will be, uh, we have to do an invasive and surgical management. So what is uh, important to us uh, as emergency physician, critical care or acute care physician is a certain cases, for example, for example, those with grade three and grade five, they carry a higher risk of complication. For example, upper airway absorption, even a laryngospasm. And the and the, the problem with this uh, classification is it based on CT scan findings. And of course, uh, until now, CT scan scanning of the neck is still considered as a gold standard. But the problem in patient that we see daily, especially in ICU, in emergency department, in our acute ward, most patient is hemodynamically unstable, especially patient with trauma. No? The hypotensive they are unstable, they bleed, and we need to do uh, aggressive fluid resuscitation of blood transfusion in this type patient. And it's quite high risk uh, because of the logistical uh, problem to move this patient uh, to radiological suite or a CT scan neck, whereby we still have to deal with the hemodynamic status. And of course, uh, there, there is a problem with the ability of radiological service support, especially in resource limited area. A good example I can share with you in disaster and remote area whereby you don't have this kind of facility. And our biggest worry is to transfer this patient in a uh, patient that, that is unstable uh, for this kind of uh, radiological modalities. So upper airway injury second to blunt neck trauma can lead to upper airway obstruction. And of course, uh, we know, we know this will potentially, uh, potentially cause a life threatening condition. And the most important aspect in the care of laryngeal trauma is to establish a secure AV. So, if you ask me, what is the role of focus AV? 
in managing these type of cases. Number one, we can recognize the important AV structure, right? Which one? Uh, which which uh what type of possible in terms of possibility, what is the pathology? We can offer early opportunity to identify life threatening upper AV injury. We can involve our expert, yeah. From, uh, for example, in, in our ENT click early, if we suspect this type of cases early before, because, before it goes into a more catastrophic kind of, uh, AV complication. And of course, it can allow assessment of the extent of the injury. So going back into this, uh, uh, ultrasound that we saw and the first question that uh, a bit puzzled, we bit puzzled at that point of time uh, from our ultrasound, whether this is a soft tissue edema because we don't have any reference for that and whether this is a mucosal interruption in this kind of injury. Uh. So we look through some of the article at that point of time then we come across this interesting article we published in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2016 by uh, Dr. Michael Schilling, whereby they used the point of care ultrasound in acute upper airway edema. It's quite interesting because uh, what they see, this is the one that I've shown you just now, this is a thyroid cartilage, and this is a vocal cord somewhere there. And that is a, a false lumen. In this article, they describe uh, the finding of uh, uh, airway edema, the mucosal edema, which is uh, can be seen clearly in airway ultrasound. The most interesting cases that uh, we found after uh, after searching all the literature, looking at the soft tissue, how is soft tissue. Uh, injury or soft tissue edema, uh, presented as, uh, ultrasound images is this article, which published by, uh, Dr. Toru Kamada, uh, from Japan, which is colleague, uh, Masato Fujita. And what they found is actually, uh, in patient with a smoke inhalation, inhalation, they're able to look at, detect, uh, detect the tracker wall thickening. This is the, the one that I mentioned, this is track here. This is uh, a mucosal interface. What they found that is thickened compared to the usual. We don't have a normal, what is a normal track here cartilage in terms of length now, in terms of diameter. In terms of diameter. But what they found, there is uh, this ultrasound images that show the hypoacute thickening of the tracker wall at the level of, which is uh, uh, somewhere around the thyroid isthmus, isthmus, yeah. And they try to compare with the CT scan, which is shown, which shown a similar finding, did indicate a thickening of a tracker wall. Huh? So the first that we we noted in this uh, article, what they see here is somewhere a mucosal tissue that line the tracker cartilage, in which in this uh, injury, smoke inhalational is thickened, swollen, okay, then, and is an ultrasound, every ultrasound able to identify the thickening of this mucosal tissue. Right? And of course, uh, subsequently, we look around, we, we noted this, uh, people use this AV ultrasound uh, to assess the laryngeal edema in post extubation period by measuring the amount of air that passing through the vocal cord by comparing the air column width before and after a calf inflation, which they can measure, they can measure the difference and they can sort of uh, predict the risks of uh, post extubation stridor, which is the third evidence that to show what we see is we able to see the, the, the mucosal edema or even uh, destruction of mucosal tissue. And of course, uh, we come across this, whereby we can use uh, AV ultrasound now looking at the, this is a thyroid cartilage, this is thyroid cartilage, and 
we can see with the ultrasound for using just using the portable ultrasound there is a disruption of the tracheal uh no uh, is a, a disruption of the thyroid cartilage using AV ultrasound so the aim of our uh, article is to discuss the role of focus AV ultrasound in upper AV whether it's feasible uh, possible with the potential usage of this, especially in laryngeal trauma. And of course, we're trying to propose a focused airway ultrasound classification in relation to shiver classification of laryngeal aging. Basically, what we're trying to do is uh, whether we can use airway ultrasound to determine whether this is minor or major uh, laryngeal trauma based on shiver classification. Because for us, as emergency patient or a critical care patient, this is very important because we can be one step or two step ahead in terms of uh, looking at the possibility how is the best way to manage the AV. And of course, we can anticipate before the AV catastrophic occurs due to all this uh, misdiagnosed uh, uh, or misidentified uh, uh, laryngeal trauma. So uh, we use these four cases. This is the first case. It's 24 years old male that presented to us with neck swelling without sign of respiratory distress after a traumatic blunt neck injury. There is a swelling the anterior part of the neck without a uh, palpable uh, crepitus. And this is what we saw in the AV ultrasound. This is the first case that I, I mentioned earlier. The first thing that we noted, there is a break in the discontinuity of this uh, uh, air mucosa interface there. And you see one here. The second thing that we noticed, this is cartilage. This is posterior part of the cartilage. You see the tissue there, the tear, the mucosa tissue there. Right? And this is what we saw. There is a swelling that increased in thermal, in thermal thickness. This might suggest the endolaryngeal destruction and even endolaryngeal hematoma. Huh? This is the exact video of this patient. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, to explain what is seen here. This is cricot cartilage. This is thyroid cartilage. This should be the cricothyroid membrane. This is hemocosal interface. You can see there's a uh, destruction of the continuity of this uh, hemocosate to face there. And if you look carefully, you might see that it's increased in terms of mucosal tissue thickness in this patient. Right? So based on this uh, uh, finding, AV finding, we are trying to relate it with the Schiffer classification. So at that point of time, we think this probably a uh, Group one, whereby we see a uh, endolaryngeal hematoma with a detectable fracture. We actually look the the at the, the cartilage individually. We can't see any fracture. Right. And of course, the CT scan confirmed the diagnosis of endo endolaryngeal disruption and hematoma without any uh, cartilage fracture. And of course, this patient was uh, managed conservatively and was discharged well at the third day after admission, the day three of the admission. The second case is a 66 years old motorcyclist. He was injured uh, in a collision with a van. He presented with mild neck pain, difficulty breathing, hoarseness of voice, dysphagia, and he had stridor. Uh, there is a swelling, uh, neck swelling, and tender with a subcutaneous emphysema, right? So this is what we found in the uh, AV ultrasound. And this is just to show, so easy for us to compare. This is normal thyroid cartilage, as I mentioned earlier. And this is just a diagram, a drawing to represent the thyroid cartilage. And you can see in a normal thyroid cartilage, it should be smooth. There's no break in terms of continuity of this uh, anterior cortex of the thyroid. And this is what we saw in this patient. This is the anterior part of the cortex of the thyroid. 
and that we suspect there's something, there is a break there, there's a defect, uh, there's a break, uh, there's a loss of, in terms of continuity of this uh, anterior part, anterior contact of the thyroid cartilage. Right. So, we try to correlate now with the uh, Schieffer classification. Uh, we think there is a lot of edema there, as, um, uh, as we've seen at the, uh, uh, at the area of Charleston images that I shared earlier. There is definitely the endolaryngeal hematoma. Yeah? There is a minor mucosal distortion. And of course, what we saw in the area of Charleston, even though we just look at the anterior part of the contact, we don't see much of the displaced fracture. There's a fracture, no doubt, about it, uh, that we see from the image. But we don't see any displacement in terms of uh, fracture. Uh, frac there is a fracture if a displacement. Right. So, uh, CT scan confirmed the finding. They're showing just a defect uh, in the posterior lateral wall of the trachea. Uh, and of course, there's a biggest uh, one. But what we saw is a fracture of the right anterior lamina of the cartilage. So basically, this, uh, this is what we saw in the area atrosan. Uh, and this defect, this continuity, there's a defect there. This is what we saw in the area atrosan. So, a uh, patient was uh, immediately intubated uh, due to the possibility uh, we suspect this patient might have a problem uh, and was started on intravenous uh, after consultation with our ENT surgeon. Okay? Intravenous DEXA to reduce the inflammation and edema. We start on proton pump inhibitor prevent reflux okay? and laryngeal irritation. Uh, we embolize with adrenaline and formulate antibiotic in the emergency department. Huh? Uh, but anyway, the patient was managed conservatively and was discharged well uh, after uh, the fifth day of post-trauma. The third case is a 28-year-old male, a martial art athlete, was kicked by his opponent and sustained a blow uh, at the anterior part of the neck and complain of pain, dysphagia, uh, hoarseness of breast, and of course we see a lot of abrasion at the part of the neck, which is tender to palpate, and there is a localized crepitus. This is the basal ultrasound. What we saw almost similar to second, the case two that I mentioned earlier, but in these type of cases, we just, we see this is a thyroid cartilage, we see this defect there, we see a multiple defect, in which at that point of time, we think this is probably a displaced fracture of the thyroid cartilage. And of course, uh, what is uh, noticeable in these images is the disruption of this anterior contact of the thyroid with a kind of uh, mixed echogenicity uh, tissue, uh, echogenicity, huh? that this probably denoting the, the, the endolaryngeal edema and the other interesting thing that this patient, in this patient that we saw, there is a paralysis of this right vocal cord. Uh, just to share with you, this is a normal, this is normal vocal cord. This is during abduction and adduction. Okay. This is the normal and, uh, vocal cord, which is, uh, uh, move towards midline during abduction and adduction. But in this patient, we saw that it's possible paralysis of this, paralysis of this, paralysis of this, right? Vocal cord. And based on this uh, uh, finding, we are trying to correlate with the CT scan of this, uh, uh, not CT scan, we based on this uh, Schiffer classification. What we saw just now, the one that I mentioned to you, that is edema, we see a cord immobility, and of course we see a displaced fracture. Right. So in this type of patient, uh, the based on this uh, finding, we think this patient probably fall a grade three. And of course, uh, we we get our ENT surgeon to double check this finding because we think at that point of time it's too dangerous to send to this patient to CT scan fit no uh, CT scan uh, suite, knowing the possibility of uh, more catastrophic. Uh, upper airway obstruction, the patient might collapse and we might having a difficulty to secure the airway. So they did a uh, flexible uh, fiber optic scope that revealed edematous and medially deviated right arytenoid with 
bridge uh, paralyzed and uh, a lot of uh, submucosal edema at the point of time. Uh, so we decide to intubate the patient. Uh, we start patient at intravenous dead cell, uh, bottom pump inhibitor, we normalize with adrenaline, and we start patient on antibiotic uh, in emergency department. Uh,